hey, Darren, good luck uh, recruiting somebody into that fellowship slot next year. <laughs> wow. What do fellows get paid these days? <laughs> okay, so uh, unfortunately, this next five-minute talk only applies to you who take care of alcoholics in the ED. So the rest of you, you know, you can kind of tune out a little bit. No, truth is we all take care of alcoholics, don't we? It's so darn common. And you all take care of patients who uh, my, had my last drink last night and uh, present an alcohol withdrawal. And, you know, I'm tremulous and I feel terrible and I'm sweaty and I'm tachycardic and I'm vomiting and, you know, all the sort of core supportive treatments uh, apply here. So fluids and antiemetics and uh, replacing vitamins and electrolytes and all that sort of thing. So we all do that stuff. And then we give them some medications to uh, try to satisfy those starving GABA receptors, right? So the, main, uh, the mainstream uh, meds, of course, what we probably do our heaviest lifting with are benzodiazepines. And there are a whole bunch of different things you can use between lorazepam and oxazepam and diazepam and every sort of PAM. And they're all sort of di you know, different flavors of the same ice cream. And they all work really well, but uh, their main differences are uh, uh, variable half-life. So the problem is they don't last long enough. They, they do a really good job of treating uh, the, the withdrawal symptoms while the patient's in the department. And certainly if they need to be admitted, they can keep getting benzos. But they don't last long enough. So if, so if you have sort of a mild to moderate patient that you improve their symptoms and discharge them home, you usually have to write them a prescription for something. Librium is sort of the traditional drug to use here. But how many of you use phenobarb for acute alcohol withdrawal? Not very many. So, um, so I hope that you uh, take note of this because this works really well for acute alcohol withdrawal, especially to me, its, it's biggest use is the population of folks who have sort of mild withdrawal and you can discharge home because you don't even have to write a prescription for them. It lasts so long, it covers their entire withdrawal period or until they start drinking again. <laughs> so um, most of us are very comfortable using it as an anticonvulsant and uh, you, you tend to use it in pretty big doses for that, right? I mean, it's a, I mean, probably many of us have used it for the status epilepticus patient. It's kind of the end of the line. You've given them tons of benzos. You've dilantin or, or phosphenatoin loaded them. And now you turn to phenobarb and you give them that 15 to 18 milligrams per kilo. You know, by that time, you're, you're, you, this is probably somebody you're about to intubate. Probably because, uh, you know, the, that phenobarb dose is pretty big and pretty sedating. Uh, and you've already given them, you know, like a 55-gallon drum of uh, Ativan by that time. But phenobarb uh, binds GABA receptors, like benzos and alcohol, has a long half-life, two to seven days. Um, it does a great job of controlling the symptoms in the ED, not as fast as benzos, but still pretty fast, certainly in the time frame that, uh, you know, that matters to us in the ED. Um, it works uh, in conjunction with benzos, and you don't have to write a prescription if you fix them well enough to discharge them home. So two studies I want to show you. Uh, this is from Highland, who is, uh, at Highland they've used phenobarb for alcohol withdrawal for many, many years. They've done several papers on it. This one was from last year. Their target population were the really sick withdrawal patients who are going to be admitted. And their, and their idea was randomize them to either a pretty good sized dose of phenobarb, 10 milligrams per kilo, um, or Ativan. Uh, or everybody got Ativan, but they got either phenobarb or placebo plus all the Ativan you wanted to give them. And their main target, their main outcome measure was what percent got admitted to the ICU. So in the phenobarb group, only 8% ended up in the ICU and 25% ended up in the Ativan group and no adverse events. We studied at my hospital a uh, lower acuity population. The target audience was those who we thought we could send home, um, gave them phenobarb in smaller doses. It comes in 130 milligram ampules. That's why you see the 260 and 130 sort of over and over in this. So we gave them 260 milligrams IV to begin with. You can also use it IM, but we gave it IV in this study. Uh, and then the doc could reassess them and give them uh, increments of 130 after that. On av the average patient got 500 milligrams or you know, between two and three doses. Or they could get Ativan and then when they were discharged, they, if they were in the Ativan group, they got a prescription for Librium. If they were in the phen phenobarb group, they got a prescription for placebo pills. So this is all blinded. Nobody knows what they're getting. We followed CEWA scores and followed them all up at 48 hours. No differences in their baseline um, CEWA scores, uh, which measures you know, their degree of their alcohol withdrawal symptoms. Um, the same amount of symptom control, same length of stay, same low rate of admission, only a handful in each group, and the 48 hour scores were the same in each group. Now it also happens to work well for this thing called feline hyperesthesia syndrome. Here kitty, kitty, kitty. Oh. <laughs> 
what the heck are you doing there? <laughs> Whoa, hey, you put that fur back on. <laughs> so any, any of you have a cat that does <laughs> Don't rub his belly, wait till you see what happens. So apparently phenobarb is one of the main, uh, one of the first treatments for this. So in summary, phenobarb is great for inpatients with uh, al acute alcohol withdrawal syndrome, 10 milligrams per kilo over 30 minutes, reduces the number who need to go to the ICU. It's really great for outpatients, and this is where I really like to use it. Again, you start off with 260 and give them another 130 or, and another 130 if they need it. No need for a prescription afterwards, and it probably works well for cats with uh, feline hyperesthesia syndrome. Thank you.